All right, take two. Good morning. Now we're going to officially get started. I want to welcome all of you to, officially to the 39th annual CSUN Assistive Technology Conference. My name is Julia Santiago. I am the managing director for the Center on Disabilities at CSUN, and we are your conference hosts. Every year, it's always so exciting to come back together, and we have so many new and returning friends this year, and just starting yesterday, you already feel the amazing energy in the air, so I'm definitely very excited. You're making me very excited for this wonderful week ahead. Um, this is a great opportunity and time for all of us to connect with so many of our old friends and make new connections and meet new people. In fact, we have many new people, uh, newcomers, I should say, this year. Um, we got a chance to welcome uh, many of you uh, yesterday evening um, at the newcomers uh, meet and greet, and then followed by our sort of backup plan, because uh, weather had a different idea, uh, to our happy hour. And it was really a great opportunity to see many of you, and I hope to uh, connect with all of you throughout the week. With that said, we have a lot in store this week, uh, so please uh, check out all of your, uh, the conference schedule as well as the agenda of events throughout the week. Uh, we have hundreds of educational sessions, um, the daily networking events uh, during the lunch hour and the social events in the, uh, at night. Uh, definitely many opportunities to uh, make new connections. Uh, for today, don't forget um, this afternoon, we'll have a special preview of the exhibit hall. Uh, we have uh, a full uh, exhibit hall this year, and this will be a great opportunity to tour the exhibit hall before it officially opens tomorrow morning. Also tonight, uh, we have our grand welcome reception. Uh, please don't miss that. It will be a great event. Um, and come hungry. And um, also, don't forget your uh, conference badges, so that way uh, you'll be able to attend. Today we have a, or this morning I should say, we have a great uh, keynote program uh, for you. Um, so now I'm going to turn over the program to Dr. Freddy Sanchez. Dr. Sanchez is the Interim Vice President of Student Affairs for Equity and Inclusion at CSUN. Freddie has been a tireless advocate for social justice, equity, and inclusive practices in higher education and has kept these important practices forefront not only to the CSUN community but the community at large. I know he is thrilled and excited to be with us this week. So without further ado, I'll welcome Freddie to the stage. Good morning. How are we feeling? We're still asleep? <laughs> all right, y'all. Well, first of all, give yourselves a round of applause for being here at 8 o'clock. As Julia mentioned, um, I serve as an assistant vice president for student affairs at CSUN, um, and I'm excited just to be here making sure that we as a community move forward really thinking about equity, really thinking about how do we create spaces where our students feel welcomed, where our community um, at large feels included in, into the campus, into the experiences that we offer. Um, at CSUN, we have a longstanding commitment, now being the 39th annual, 39th annual, Julia, 39th annual. Um, we will be celebrating 40 next year, and, and I'm sure it will be even better than this year, not quite, this year is great as well. We have a great keynote speaker that we'll, we'll be sharing in a little bit. Um, but ultimately, you're all here. How many of you, by a show of hands or a cheer, this is your first conference? Look around. Just look around, y'all. Keep your hands up if you, if you have them up. Just look around. More than half of this room is here for the first time and we're glad that you're here experiencing that for yourselves. I'm proud and excited for all the initiatives around the campus. Um, just last year, we created a new minor in disability studies. Um, and so really thinking about how do we as an institution um, look at account accountability for ourselves, 
um, as we think about accessibility. Um, and so we are excited to, to be offering that as a campus. Um, we're showcasing, we received the seal of Excelencia um, just this past year, which ultimately means that we're serving our largest population on our campus. Um, and so as we think about these new initiatives, we always challenge ourselves what is it that we're needing to do at this particular conference? And we have a great lineup of keynote speakers, a great lineup of, of featured sessions, um, and a lot of conference sessions that you, I know for a fact that you all will be enjoying. Now, at this moment, um, so that we can get along with the program, I want to, to bring up to our stage Ted Drake, who is an experienced engineer, a developer and evangelist, and accessibility expert. He is the global accessibility leader for Intuit's desktop, web, and mobile products. He's the co-founder of Intuit's Ability Network for employees and promotes their diversity in hiring programs. Prior to being at Intuit, Ted co-founded Yahoo's Accessibility Lab and was a developer evangelist. Ted's passion for accessibility and his outstanding leadership in building an inclusive community have been priceless to the CSUN conference. Ted is serving as our chair for our programs this year. So Ted, welcome. Hi everybody. Uh, let me make sure I get this up. Is that okay? Right. Hi everybody, thank you for joining. I was really excited to see so many people last night at the first time uh, event. Um, we have like generations within our accessibility community going back from like 1980, well, ADA Act. We have that group of generation, and we had another generation that came around 2000. Um, and now we have a new generation coming. I can't wait to see what everybody brings forward. We have all new technology. And the sessions going on this, uh, this week are gonna be really insightful. I want everybody to learn something new, go to different presentations. Um, I can't wait to see what it's like next year and five years from now with all the energy that's in this room. Um, I normally don't have notes. I'm usually the kind of person that talks off the top of my head, but I have notes for today. <laughs> so I just want you to know that's why I'm looking down. But uh, I have the pleasure today of introducing the 2024 Strachey Leadership Award. Uh, this award acknowledges the recipient's work with students as an educator and mentor. Uh, while remaining a leader in their respective field through publications, presentations, and research. This year's recipient is a photojournalist, a filmmaker, and probably most importantly, a father. Um, his films take a slower pace. Uh, they're not a Guy Ritchie action film. These are films that let you into the situation, let you understand the person. Um, the awkward pauses, the long shots. These are what's interesting about his films. As an example, there's a film called Mr. Connolly Has ALS. And this is a film about a very popular principal at a school who develops ALS. And as the symptoms start getting longer, uh, more pronounced, I should say, they invite the students to come in one at a time into a room and the student and the principal are just sitting face to face and asking really deep questions. Um, these are the kind of films that he makes, films that give you those deep insights into the people. See, I'm not even looking at my notes. The, the people um, uh, that are actually changing our communities. Uh, he started a series with his first film, which was called Including Samuel. Samuel is his youngest son, and Samuel was born with cerebral palsy. And as a child, Samuel was, uh, they had the decision, do they uh, use a integrated school or a non-integrated school? And they chose to bring Samuel to an integrated school. And this was an early time in integrated schools. So this is a film about a young child, I think he was like three or four, I can't exactly say what age, in learning this school system. Um, you see the potential and you see the challenges for the students, the teachers, and the administrators. I remember one teacher was saying that she had a student, she didn't know how to incorporate the students. She didn't know how to change her lessons plans and it was extremely difficult for her that year. Um, so much so that she said, I hope I don't have another year like this. I, I personally have that experience. I, um, I used to teach photography 
And I was told one day, uh, you've got a new student that's gonna join the class that has Tourette's. That's all they told me. I had no idea what to do. I knew what Tourette's was, but I didn't know, should like, I warn the students? Should I acknowledge the Tourette's? Or should we just sort of like ignore it? Um, and I chose wrongly. I chose to just ignore it. And I don't think I gave that person a welcoming experience. And she didn't come back for the second week. These are some of the things that, you know, as educators, we need to be better prepared for. And our recipient this year, Dan Habib, that's what he's been doing. He's been providing these deep insight films into what is the life, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities. His latest works, um, I think one of them's called um, My Disability Roadmap, and I can't remember the other one, I didn't write it on my notes, are about Samuel. Samuel's now graduating high school, going to prom, going to college, thinking about uh, career opportunities. So you're seeing this progression. Um, Dan has worked, so I mentioned his name offhand, Dan Habib. He's worked with the University of New Hampshire's Institute on Disability and is currently the Inclusive Project Director at the Westchester Institute for Human Development and founder of Like Right Now Films. Dan was not able to make today's conference. However, he's a filmmaker. <laughs> so he shared his appreciation with a following video that they will now be showing. Hi everyone, I'm Dan Habib. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm here in my office in Concord, New Hampshire. As a visual description, I'm a 58 year old white man balding with a check shirt and I have paintings behind me from two artists from my films. Uh, Nair Shahid from Intelligent Lives painted the sunflowers and the painting on the other side is by Emily Huff who is featured in my film, including Samuel. I am incredibly honored to receive the Fred Strachey Award today and I'm so sorry I can't be there in person, but I do have the award and I'm very grateful that you shipped it to me ahead of time. Um, I've read a little bit about Dr. Strachey and just incredibly honored to be in uh, his company in, in this way through this award. Somebody that was such a great mentor and educator and leader in the field of assistive technology and disability rights and disability justice. Um, so I wish I could be with you, but I will just share briefly that uh, my history, like many people, changed dramatically because of my parenting. My, my experience with my son Samuel, who's now 24, um, has changed my life in so many profound ways when we realized he had a disability at the age of one. And I'm happy to say it's really changed my life immeasurably, immeasurably for the better, even though so much of parenting a child with a disability can be challenging and exhausting. Um, Samuel's spirit, his energy, but even just his connection that he's helped me make to the disability justice community, to this amazing world out there of people with disabilities, leaders um, in the field of education, of assistive technology, of disability rights and justice, getting the opportunity to change my career from being a photojournalist to a filmmaker, which led me here today, uh, getting this award, working with people like the incredible Judy Human and Bob Williams and so many other amazing disability rights leaders has been formative and such a, a positive impact on my life and my family's life. And all that is, is thanks to Samuel. So probably the best thing that's happening these days that um, makes me excited to talk to you and receive this award is Samuel and I are now co-directing films together. We just finished the film, My Disability Roadmap, which was in the New York Times uh, recently, about a year ago, and won an Emmy, uh, which was an incredible, happy surprise. And now we're expanding that into a, a feature length film called The Ride Ahead, which we're so excited to share with you later this year, 2024, when it comes out. So working with Samuel, seeing him follow in the footsteps of so many other great leaders like Dr. Strachey, like Judy Human, Bob Williams, Keith Jones, Maysoon Zaid, I could go on and on, um, is, is what this work is all about. It's what so much of my life has been about, about making sure that all people with disabilities have equal access to all aspects of society. Certainly we focus a lot of energy on Samuel, but through our shared work together, through the work you're all doing there where you are today, all of that is about creating a better world for people with disabilities, the people that love them, but even large, more largely our community and our society to making it a, a part of the natural diversity of our society. Uh, disability is not seen that way and it needs to be seen that way. So on behalf of both me and Samuel, who's the reason I'm in a position to accept this award, we thank you so much. We're incredibly honored and we hope you have a wonderful conference and thanks again. Thank you. 
Uh, speaking of celebrating outstanding achievements, uh, please welcome Klaus Mazenberger, the Journal Track Program Chair and Scientific Editor of the Journal on Technology and Persons with Disabilities. Thank you, everybody. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Klaus Miesenbergen. I'm from Austria, not Australia. Mountains, skiing, no kangaroos, and no koalas. And I have to look a bit down as well because uh, English is not my first language. I'm very honored to, once more to be uh, involved in the Journal of the CSUN Conference because progress and advancement and socio-technical innovation very much depend on rigorous experimenting, studying and science and research. We would not be here, ladies and gentlemen, without the scientific dedication of many to innovation. Many of the technologies and services solutions and a lot of things which you will see displayed, exhibited, and discussed during this conference would not be here without this rigorous scientific approach. The origin of CSUN conference is closely related to science and research in assistive technology, accessibility, and social inclusion for people with disabilities. Never forget where you come from. Therefore, CSUN wants to make sure that science and research is and will be also in the future part of the fascinating ecosystem of transforming our societies in a more inclusive one. To guarantee that science and research stay part of CSUN is the mission of the Journal on Technology and People with Disabilities. It offers the possibility to present newest ideas, concepts, studies, prototypes to the unique CSUN family. They are reviewed and evaluated by at least three reviewers from all over the world before they are accepted for publication. With the Dr. Art Kashma Award for Assistive Technology Research, named after our dear friend, outstanding colleague, and supporter of CSUN, we acknowledge this difficult and important work of scientists. The journal and the award guarantee that CSUN is the place where all stakeholders in the value chain of inclusion of people with disabilities meet and cross-fertilize. People propose science, studies, and technology, as well as business, conform. The Dr. Art Kashma Award for Assistive Technology Research recognizes an exemplary contribution in research pushing the advancement of assistive technology and accessibility forward. This should motivate researchers and scientists to aim at rigorous quality and excellence as an indi indispensable ingredient for improving the quality of life for people with disabilities. The scientific track accepts the best papers only, and this award honors the best of the best. This year, 2024, the Dr. Art Kashma Award for AT Research goes to the paper published in cooperation of the University of Washington and Utah State University, Predictors of Post-Secondary Web Accessibility, 2012 to 2022 by Terrell Thompson, Scott Ferguson, Dustin Boker, Chad Smith, and Elizabeth Moore. Congratulations. Thank you, everyone. I, too, have a cheat sheet. There are lots of people that contributed to this, um, including a, a couple of others that were too long to, to fit in the credits there. 
But our, our research tracks progress in higher education website accessibility over a 10-year span, as the title suggests, and seeks to identify which of dozens of independent variables make the best predictors of web accessibility among US colleges and universities. We looked at digital accessibility policies, OCR resolutions, lawsuits, and much more. And we'll be here in this room tomorrow at 9.20 uh, presenting on this paper. So I hope you can join us there to find out which of all those independent variables is the best predictor. Um, and, and again, I happen to be the person who's accepting this award, but it very much was a team effort. Uh, Jared Smith from WebAIM will be co-presenting with me tomorrow. Liz Moore did an amazing job with a statistical analysis and also is a brilliant copy editor. My longtime colleagues at the University of Washington, Dan Comden and Cheryl Bergstaller, completed this paper and then retired from the UW after a combined 75 years of service. And Dan, I know, is in Spain right now, I think watching. And Cheryl is probably in Hawaii. So they're both living the good life. And they're passing the torch to the next generation. My colleague Scott Ferguson at the UW spent countless hours conducting policy analyses. And Dustin Bowker, a student in the UW School of Law, is passionate about disability rights law. And I wouldn't be surprised if you see him here at future CSUNs. He spent countless hours querying law library da databases to get the legal um, data for this study. And today is Dustin's birthday. So happy birthday to Dustin. And thank you, everyone, for your contributions to this paper. All right, y'all. I am pleased to introduce this year's keynote speaker, Haben Gurma. Haben Gurma is a human rights lawyer advancing disability justice. She is the first deaf blind person to graduate from Harvard Law School. Did y'all hear that? Okay. Yes. And President Obama named her a White House Champion of Change. She received the Helen Keller Achievement Award, a spot on the Forbes 30 under 30 list, and Times 100 talks. President Bill Clinton, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, and Chancellor Angela Marco have all honored Hamin. The New York Times, Oprah Magazine, and Today's Show featured her, her memoir, Hobbin, The Deafblind Woman Who Conquered Harvard Law. Please join me in welcoming Hobbin Herma to the stage. It's working, excellent. Good morning, CSUN. <laughs> Thank you for that very warm welcome. I'm deaf blind, as you heard, and that means I have limited vision and hearing. Deaf blindness is a spectrum of vision and hearing loss. Most of the world is designed for people who could see and hear. So I grew up asking myself, 
How do I gain access to community? The library near me didn't have any braille books. The schools I attended were designed for sighted hearing students. The slide on screen says disabled people drive innovation. That's true. Many of us are put in the situation where if we want access, we have to come up with solutions for access. And I found myself in that position seeking touch-based solutions. Ah, it sounds like we have tech issues. <laughs> let, can you let me know when it's fixed? It's working on the computer, but it's not working on here. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> because everything is, is plugged in. Thank you for your patience. Okay. Let me do that. Yeah, go to other page. There we go. Okay, go to graphics. Thank you. In 2010, a new piece of Braille tech came out that had Bluetooth support. And I realized, wait a minute, I can connect this to an external keyboard. That would allow me to read in Braille as people type. Most people around me don't know sign language. Most people don't know Braille. But lots of people can type, especially Gen Zers. <laughs> so I started using the system. And I'm using it today to have access with you, to have community with all of you here. In the front row, I have a typist with a keyboard who's typing audience feedback. So he'll let me know when people smile, laugh, fall asleep. <laughs> He's watching you. In all seriousness, our society says the way you listen is by sitting still, making eye contact, being quiet. But that's not true for all of our bodies. So we need to create inclusive communities where people are welcomed with all their different bodies and minds. So if you need to stretch, Go to the restroom, move around. That's absolutely OK. Communication access is something I've been exploring for a long time. I've noticed that a lot of times communities only have certain kinds of voices. And voices that depend on sign language are often not heard or voices that use assistive devices for access, whether they're typing their words or using braille displays, are not always respected. So I'm honored that Susan has invited me here to give people more opportunities to learn about communication access. One piece of access is patience, making time for interpretation, making time for all the different ways we communicate. My disability has been an opportunity for innovation. The Braille keyboard, Braille display and keyboard that I used, it helped me enter a bar for the first time. Those are predominantly noisy, dark spaces, which is difficult for deafblind people. And when I was in law school, lots of my classmates were meeting up and connecting in bars. So I said, I'm going to conquer bars. I'm going to figure out how to make this work. <laughs> that definitely deserved an applause. <laughs> So I went 
went to a bar armed with my braille display and keyboard. My guide dog and I walked in. We couldn't see or hear what was happening. I noticed someone approached me and I told them, can I get access to a table or bar top so I could set up my keyboard and braille computer? She guided me to a spot. I set it up and started communicating with people. My classmates discovered that the system actually made it easier for them. They were tired and exhausted from shouting to be heard. But when they sat down to talk with me, their voices could take a break. This is an example that happens over and over again in our community. We find a solution designed for very, a very specific disability and it ends up helping lots of other people. I'll share another example. One of the fathers of the internet is deaf, hard of hearing, Vint Cerf. He helped develop one of the earliest email protocols. And through email, deaf people could communicate long distance without straining to hear over the phone. Since then, Lots of hearing people use email. <laughs> if you design for the deaf community, you could end up building lots of solutions that help many other people. Another tech example. In the 90s, there was an engineering student and his disability made it really difficult and uncomfortable to type on keyboards. Back then, keyboards were a lot stiffer and it required force to push down on keyboards. And he used that as a design challenge. What's another way to operate computers that requires zero force? Wayne Westerman and his professor, John Elias, founded Fingerworks and they developed gestural, touch-based, zero-force keyboards. Apple purchased Fingerworks and fused that technology into the iPhone. So if you use iPhones, you're using tech that was sparked by the brilliance of disabled people. There are lots of examples throughout our history. It is shame and fear that keeps many of these stories hidden. It's my hope we can get past the fear. I still get a lot of people who say no. They will not talk to me. The braille display and keyboard is too weird, it's too strange, and they just walk away. That was happening at law school and many other places. I want to share an example of someone who said, yes, let's do this. Photo, please. This is a photo from the White House from the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And in the photo, I'm standing by a computer, the Braille computer, on a table opposite me is President Obama typing on a keyboard and President Biden is also in the room watching the conversation. We explained, I am deaf, blind, and access information best through Braille. They graciously switched from voicing to typing so I can access their words. When you choose inclusion, you role model it for other people around you, and you encourage more people to invest in accessibility. In the long, painful summer of 2020, my Braille computer died. It served me for 10 years. I wanted to repair it. They no longer did repairs. I wanted to buy another one. It was no longer sold. And I shared this story on social media and many other disabled people had experiences with hearing aids, wheelchairs, 
and other disability tech. You search high and low for a device that works with your body and your lifestyle. You learn to work with it. You fall in love with it. And then you discover the next iteration of the product is harder on your body or no longer has the feature that you were relying on for access. Around the world, right to repair legislation is being passed, but it was too late for the Braille Note Apex. It's my hope that when we build tech, we build with sustainability in mind. When people fall in love with your product, cherish those relationships with customers. A lot of people assume deaf blindness is the biggest barrier I encounter. It's not. The biggest barrier is ableism. Next slide. A-B-L-E-I-S-M. Ableism is a set of beliefs and practices that treat disabled people as inferior to non-disabled people. Building a school, only imagining non-disabled students going to that school. Building a website, only imagining non-disabled engineers on your web team. Sometimes people say, we didn't intend to discriminate. Unintentional ableism is still ableism. It is so deeply embedded in our culture that we just assume that, of course, a blind person can't do this, or of course, a deaf person can't do that. And we need people to start noticing ableism and removing it from our technologies. When I was a student in college, trying to figure out what career I would have. I wanted to get a job, to get experience in different fields. My classmates had an easy time getting summer jobs, but no one wanted to hire a deaf-blind woman. I was talking to friends, and one of my friends told me, I know where you can get a job. Alaska. Well, I really wanted a job. <laughs> they were right. Before I even set foot in Alaska, I lined up a job. I was hired to give tours of the Capitol building in Juneau, Alaska. They loved my application. They loved my interview. And on the very first day, we were having orientation. And about an hour into orientation, they pulled me aside and said it was a mistake to hire you. I was shocked. Why? How could that be? They knew I was deaf. It was part of our interview, and they seemed absolutely fine with that. They knew I was black. That was also in my application. So this can't be racism, right? I asked the manager, are you firing me because I'm blind? And she said, no, it's because you're from California. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> so once again, I was searching for a job, and now I was doing that in Alaska. They had lots of job openings. There's a big tourism industry in the summer in Juneau. Lots of people come up to see whales, eagles, glaciers. I sent in applications. Employers were impressed with my grades in school, with my volunteer experiences. They'd call me in for interviews. As soon as they realized I'm disabled, They'd come up with all kinds of excuses not to hire me. These were tactile jobs. They did not require sight. Washing dishes in restaurants, folding laundry in hotels. 
When I was a kid, I told my parents, blind people can't do dishes. Don't ask me to do dishes. <laughs> they didn't fall for it. <laughs> so I had lots of experience in this field. But employers assumed there's only one way to do it, and it's the sighted way. Their assumptions were the problem. Ableism was the problem. My disability did not prevent me from doing the jobs. It was ableism, unemployment discrimination. I kept trying, and I found a manager who asked me, how would you do the job? I told her. She listened and hired me to work the front desk of a small gym in Juneau, Alaska. That summer, I learned a lot about gym equipment. <laughs> One day, a woman came up to the front desk and said, a treadmill isn't working. I followed her to the treadmill, and I felt the machine from top to bottom. Near the bottom, there was a switch. I flicked the switch, and the machine worked to life. <laughs> she told me, oh my goodness, I didn't see that switch. <laughs> I told her I didn't see it either. <laughs> Tactile techniques sometimes beat visual techniques. There's so many ways to do things in our world. Mainstream culture is ocular-centric, vision-centric, and we need to recognize that there are many different ways to do things. Alternative ways are equal in value to mainstream ways. Employment discrimination impacts lawyers with disabilities, engineers with disabilities. So we really need to educate more people in noticing ableism and removing ableism from our communities. And one way you could help educate people is reminding them that disabled people are talented. In fact, disabilities are opportunities for innovation. I'll share more examples. Next slide. I've given talks at many universities. This is a video from Instituto Tecnológico de Sonora, a university in Mexico. And I'm signing with a friend, Yair, who was a student back then, but now he's a teacher. He is watching my signs. He is sighted and deaf. And as a deafblind person, I'm holding my hands over his hands to feel his signs. If you can't hear language, you can create a visual language. And deaf communities all over the world have developed signed languages. The dominant one in the US is American Sign Language. In Mexico, it's Mexican Sign Language. LSM. When I'm in Sonora, Yahir is my interpreter, facilitating communication between me and the deaf community that relies on LSM. Disabled people are often framed as always needing help, but oftentimes disabled people are the helpers, the interpreters, the guides. All over the world, Deaf people are creating community. In India, there's various signed languages, and the dominant one is Indian Sign Language. Let's have the photo from India. I visited a National Institute of Speech and Hearing in Kerala in the south of India. And this photo shows a large auditorium with hundreds of people signing ILY. It starts with a fist, and then you raise pinky index thumb. That's the ILY sign. It means respect, love, admiration. That sign started in America, 
and has moved all over the world. Many different deaf communities know ILY. And that raises the question, wouldn't it be easier if all deaf people use the same sign language? Wouldn't it be easier if all hearing people spoke the same language? <laughs> Sometimes when people are working on tech, there's a desire to simplify the disability community, to flatten us to one dimension. And there is some pressure to downplay and hide some of the different sign languages around the world. It's important to recognize that we are multidimensional. We're parts of many different communities, and we need to celebrate all these different languages. So while it would be easier to flatten disabled people, don't do that. It does not lead to good tech or good community. The deaf-blind community recognizes that many of these sign languages around the world are visual in nature. We want a language that centers touch, and deaf-blind pioneers are working on pro-tactile, a language centering touch-based communication. Skin is one of our largest organs, there's so much potential to communicate through touch. I'm excited for more technology at the intersection of haptics and the disability community. Next slide. Another example of touch-based communication. This is a video of me salsa dancing at a club in New York City. I learned to salsa dance at a camp for the blind in California called Enchanted Hills Camp. We had a blind dance instructor teaching us salsa, swing, merengue. There is, I have heard from many different disabled people around the world that it's difficult to find a community we have spaces like CSUN or Enchanted Hills Camp to form community with other disabled people, but this is not always available. And it's really important that disabled kids and adults get access to spaces where they can come together and learn from blind dancers, disabled engineers, and many members of our community. So I was very blessed to get access to that in California, and it helped me develop as a dancer. I've danced all over the world, in India, Dubai, the UK. One time I tried dancing in Washington, DC, and they said, no, you can't come in, no dogs. I told them the dog with me is a seeing eye dog well-trained, well-behaved, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, everywhere the public can go, guide dogs can go. Taxis, restaurants, hotels. They said no. I explained again, don't worry, the dog's not gonna dance. Deaf blindness doesn't prevent me from dancing, but ableism can prevent me from dancing. It's the biggest barrier I face, and many other disabled people share the same thing. I'm now an advocate, but I wasn't always an advocate. I was really shy as a kid. I didn't know how to come up with solutions, how to advocate with teachers. And that slowly started to change when I went to college. I applied to several different colleges. One of the colleges told me, you know it snows here. How are you going to walk around and get to classes? Are you sure you want to go to school here? 
Many colleges discouraged me from going due to ableism. Lewis and Clark told me we've never had a Braille reader before, but we did our research and we're ready to purchase a Braille embosser. We'll get translation software. And the summer before I started, the reading specialist trained herself to convert to print to Braille. So when I started, I had access to all my textbooks. My exams were in Braille. She even talked to the outdoor club so I can join in rock climbing and kayaking. There was just one problem. The cafeteria menu was only in print. Sighted students could walk over, read the menu, and go to their station of choice. I went to the manager and explained, this is a design problem. It's not a blindness problem. It's an accessibility problem. And here are some solutions. We can add Braille. We can have the menu online or emailed to students. I have tech that allows me to read emails and websites that are accessible. The manager said, we're very busy. We have over a thousand students. We don't have time to do special things for students with special needs. Just to be clear, eating is not a special need. There is this idea that non-disabled people are independent. That's not true. Many of you like drinking coffee. Very few of you grow your own coffee beans. <laughs> you depend on other people to harvest the beans, and that's OK. But we should be honest about the fact that everyone depends on other people. The difference between accommodations for sighted people and accommodations for blind people is ableism. There are lights in this room. There are slides on the screen. Those are accommodations for sighted people. They cost money. Lights and slides cost money. But we invest in that because accommodations for sighted people is normalized. I'm using a microphone. That's accommodations for hearing people. There are chairs in the audience. Those are accommodations for walking people. Ableism is often hidden, and we don't notice these differences. But hopefully, more people will notice so that accommodations for disabled people cease to be special, different, or extra. The cafeteria manager didn't seem to understand this. And I was stuck not having access to the menu. There were about six different stations at the cafeteria. I didn't have access to the menu, so I'd have to choose one at random. Get in line, get a plate, find a table, try the food. There were some unpleasant surprises. <laughs> I told myself, just be grateful. Millions of people around the world struggle for food. Who was I to complain? My mother, when she was my age, was a refugee in Sudan. Who was I to complain? Maybe this was a lesson for me and other disabled people that we should just get used to inferior services. I tried ignoring it, tolerating it, but the issue was happening day after day, several times a day. I was sharing my frustration with friends, and they reminded me it's my choice. It's our choice to accept unfairness or advocate for justice. So I went online and did research, and I went back to the manager and told him, 
The Americans with Disabilities Act prohibits discrimination against students with disabilities. If they don't provide access to the menu, I'm going to take legal action. I had no idea how to do that. <laughs> I was 19. I couldn't afford a lawyer. Now I know there are nonprofit legal centers helping students with disabilities. But back then, I didn't know that. All I knew is I had to try. I had to do something. The next day, the manager apologized and promised to make the menus accessible. They started emailing them on time in formats I could read. So I would get an email and I could read on my braille computer, station four, cheese tortellini. Then I could use my cane and navigate all the way to station four. Life became delicious. The next year, the next year, a new blind student came to the college. He had access to the menu, and that taught me when I advocate, even for seemingly small things like menus, it makes a difference in my community. There are many Barriers we dismiss as small. Barriers impacting women, impacting people of color, impacting disabled people. And we tell ourselves, oh, there's worse things in the world. Just deal with it. When we take time to address a small barrier, we build up the skills to master the larger obstacles. I wanted to build up my skills. And law school would let me do that. So I started applying to different law schools. The schools started responding. Harvard told me we've never had a deaf-blind student before. I told them I've never been to Harvard before. <laughs> they didn't have all the answers, but they were ready to try different accommodations until we found a solution that worked. That was not always the case. Helen Keller was a brilliant deaf-blind woman. She lived from 1880 to 1968. She told her family she wanted to go to Harvard, but the school would not admit her. Back then, they only admitted men. Helen Keller's disability wasn't the problem. Harvard was the problem. Over time, the school changed. The culture changed and opened its doors to women, people of color, and disabled people. Deaf-blind women have always been brilliant. The school has come a long way since Helen's time, but there's still more work to do. A lot of people ask me, what was the hardest thing at Harvard? The hardest thing was ableism. It came up in many different ways. I'll share one example. I was at a networking event the first semester. I was at a table with my Braille computer. Across from me, an interpreter was typing visual and audio descriptions of what was happening in the room. I asked for one of the lawyers to come over. He came over. He would not talk to me. He only spoke to the interpreter. He told her, wow, what a beautiful dog. Does the dog go to class with her? That must be a smart dog. I told him, everything you're saying is coming through in Braille. I know it can be confusing, to talk to a deaf-blind person for the first time. It may make more sense if you try typing. Do you want to try typing? Again, he would not talk to me. He only spoke to the interpreter. He told her, I've enjoyed watching you too. Tell her she's very inspiring. And he walked away. He was not inspired to offer me a job. 
A lot of times when non-disabled people feel awkward or nervous around a disabled person, they drop the word inspiring. That becomes a mask for pity. It's like saying, I'm inspired to stop complaining because at least my life isn't as miserable as yours. We don't want pity. I do love inspiration when it's tied to action. If someone says, I'm inspired to learn salsa dancing, or I'm inspired to make my website accessible, that's excellent inspiration. Ableism is exhausting. This work often falls on the shoulders of disabled people. And it's important to take breaks to recharge. I do that through dancing, going on walks with friends, enjoying delicious food and ice cream. All of you, I'm sure, have times when you find advocacy exhausting. Remember to take breaks when you need to, to recharge. So I did that during my schooling days and finally graduated. I have the photo to prove it. <laughs> photo, please. This is a photo from graduation. Dean Minow is handing me my diploma. Now it's up. <laughs> Dean Minow is handing me my diploma, and the dean and I are wearing academic regalia, and my guide dog is wearing a fancy fur coat. <laughs> I have been describing photos and videos throughout this presentation. That's an accessibility practice. It's important that all of our content is accessible, including our digital content. So if you post photos, from this event or any other related photos, add image descriptions so blind people can also be part of the conversation. We do this for videos too, adding descriptions to our videos. Descriptive transcripts are very important for deaf blind people. I can't see captions on videos and I can't hear the audio description track. So the way I access videos is through descriptive transcripts. Not enough organizations are doing this. So just a gentle reminder, add descriptive transcripts to your videos. The dog in the photo is not the same dog that's here with me. The dog in the photo is Maxine. She guided me through college, law school, the White House, and so many big moments in my life. She passed away due to cancer, and it was really difficult losing a guide, a life partner. I used a cane for a while. The cane has its benefits. And I respect people who choose the cane, but there's something incredibly powerful about guy gliding through life with a guide dog, walking with six legs instead of two legs. So I went back to guide dog school, the seeing eye in New Jersey, and they partnered me with Milo. We started by walking around the school, downtown Morristown, and then we took the dogs to New York. If a dog can guide in Times Square, they can guide anywhere. <laughs> Members of the tech community regularly ask me if I'm ready to replace my dog with a robot. The guide dog is absolutely incredible. So you have to have a really amazing robot to actually get me to, to consider looking at it. 
You know accessibility is important, but sometimes you encounter stubborn, difficult people who say, it's too expensive, we don't have time, why should we bother with accessibility? So I want to share some arguments you can use to help increase accessibility. Next slide. So the first argument is that you increase your audience. There's over 1.3 billion disabled people around the world. That's an incredible market. It's also one of the largest untapped talent pools. Another argument is with tech, with digital content. When you add image descriptions to photos, captions and transcripts to videos, more text is associated with your content, search engine optimization, you increase content discoverability when you invest in accessibility. But my favorite argument is that disability and disabled people drive innovation. We shared some examples. I'll share more. Back before email, back before even Braille, there were two friends in Italy, one sighted, one blind. They wanted to send each other letters, but they had to keep their letters secret. They were love letters. And they thought, hmm, what's a way to write that doesn't require sight? That challenge inspired them to build one of the first working typewriters. With a typewriter, you can memorize the layout of the keys and type without sight. Today, lots of people write letters on keyboards, and some of the fastest typists are touch typists. Disability drives innovation, but love also drives innovation. <laughs> this happens a lot, and we came up with a name for it, the curve cut effect. That name comes from Berkeley, California. In the 60s and 70s, disabled people advocated for curb cuts. That's the curb, the ramps at the end of sidewalks. So you have a sidewalk, a ramp going down to the street, and then a ramp going back up to the sidewalk. And the city said, that's too expensive. It's going to take too long to have curb cuts installed. Disabled people kept advocating. And finally, the city installed curb cuts. People who use wheelchairs gain greater freedom and mobility moving around Berkeley. Parents pushing strollers gain greater freedom. Travelers with luggage, kids with skateboards. In 2024, Cities with curb cuts benefit from autonomous delivery robots. Those robots can use the curb cuts. And when you invest in accessibility, you pave the way for greater innovation in the entire community. So that's the curb cut effect. And that is one of the reasons we need to invest in accessibility. Don't wait until the product is finished. Start planning for accessibility at the beginning. I have had so many people say, we are not ready. We'll think about accessibility when the product's done. That's like saying, we'll think about elevators once a high rise is finished. <laughs> it's more expensive and time consuming to try to, access to, try to add accessibility later. Plan for it from the start. If a stubborn, difficult person is still not convinced, tell them about legal requirements. <laughs> the Americans with Disabilities Act and many civil rights laws around the world prohibit discrimination against disabled people in employment, in education, 
and in technology. Litigation is expensive and time consuming. It's really important that you choose accessibility rather than dealing with lawsuits. A really great resource is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Next slide. It's a set of technical standards for designing websites for a variety of different disability experiences. Hearing disabilities, learning disabilities, mobility disabilities. These guidelines are a starting point. It's really important to keep learning. Hire accessibility experts. Make sure you have accessibility professionals in your organization. And we need disabled people represented in all levels of the organization, from entry-level positions to senior and leadership positions. Next slide. Beware of AI accessibility solutions. A keynote speaker had a fantastic talk, but I missed it. So she sent me the AI transcript. And the next day she said, Hobbin, please believe me. I didn't say you're dead. I said you're deaf. I told her, don't worry about it, I'm used to it. That made me realize that's not right. Deaf people should not have to get used to being called dead. <laughs> we have a lot of researchers and engineers in this room. We need more people studying. What are the harms AI is causing to the deaf and hard of hearing community. A great way to use AI is to create the first draft of transcripts or caption tracks and then have a human go through and edit dead to deaf and other terrible errors that keep coming up. There are companies that claim you can add one line of code to your website and it'll make your website instantly accessible to a variety of different disability experiences. I've tried some of those services and they make websites harder for me. Other blind and disabled people have also said they make websites harder for them. AI is helpful in very specific, limited situations. And it's important we're careful in how and when we choose to use it. There was a new app that came out that helped identify when lights were green and it was safe to cross the street. It would vibrate so I could use it. I would go up to the crosswalk, hold up my phone, and if it vibrated, I'd know it was safe to cross. I was using it for a while, and then one day, I walked up to the crosswalk. It vibrated. I started to cross, and the friend said, no, actually the light's still red. In high stakes situations like that, we need to be extra careful about AI. In situations where a false positive could get someone killed, we need to be very cautious about using AI. And I hope we have more researchers studying what are the harms AI is doing to the disability community. There are lots of people looking into the benefits, but we also need people studying the harms of AI. Next slide. And this is the final slide. My website's on screen, habengrima.com. I'm on various social media channels and love conversation at habengrima. And my book is on screen. 
I wanted to teach people about ableism and the different ways it comes up in our communities, in school, in technology, in work. And stories are a powerful way to help these lessons stick. It's called Haben, the Deaf Blind Woman Who Conquered Harvard Law. A lot of people were telling me, wow, you overcame your disability to go to Harvard. No, I'm still disabled. <laughs> it was Harvard that had to learn to overcome ableism. They're still working on it. And all of society. <laughs> all of us need to continue working on noticing ableism and removing it from our tech and our communities. Your time is a gift. Thank you so much for listening to me today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Can we just be in awe with Haben real quick? Haben, thank you so much for ind indulging us in our, your fabulous talk. It has been inspirational. It's a challenge for all of us to really think critically in the way we serve. Um, so thank you. And this is for you. I'm going to put it right here. So you can take a picture. I'm going to, can, can you grab? Wow, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Was that not inspirational? Haben, I think you have challenged us to, to really look at this conference in a different, in a different experience. Uh, we all came with a vision. Um, hopefully you all are challenged to go to sessions that you might have not identified that you needed to go to. Um, and so be sure to check out the conference schedule and take advantage of the many opportunities to connect with your fellow participants. There's a lot of new participants here. So if you are a participant who has been here and can guide other participants throughout the conference, please do so. There's a lot, of, a lot in store for, uh, this year with daily feature presentations that start each morning, the birds of the feather, networking events. Julia mentioned that this evening there is a reception. Hopefully you can join us today. There's lots of social events. We heard that we needed to provide that and so we, we have accommodated that. There's the CSUN ATC TV broadcast studio. The broadcast studio is here in, in this particular room and has a fully daily schedule of featured presentations, conference sessions, and fireside chats. Don't forget us to join us this afternoon for a special exclusive preview of, of the exhibit hall and bring your appetite for the welcome reception tonight at seven o'clock. Finally, I would like to thank all of you, our sponsors, our sponsors, our exhibitors that truly make this conference an experience. But before I go, I wanna thank the, the CSUN COD, the Center on Disabilities for really taking, it, taking the critical feedback that you all have given to plan this year's conference. So if you are a CSUN um, COD staff and you're in the room, can you wave, shake your hands, stand up. Thank you so much for your, for your support. This concludes this morning portion. We welcome to, to join you. Thank you.